Okay, so let me begin. I have a little bit of an announcement to make, and uh, I hate to make it. So um, I got a call this week, um, uh, early, and um, they sold the church building um, to developers who are going to bulldoze it and put in houses. So um, I need to let you know that because change is in the wind. Um, it was already sold, signed, and done before we found out about it. And um, at first I was upset. Well, I still am kind of, but I was actually, this week I've been kind of overwhelmed with um, gratitude, feeling so thankful that um, we've had this funky building uh, that used to be a dance hall. Um, and, and yet it's worked really well. And uh, it's helped us become who we are. And uh, I don't know what's next. You may have questioned, like, we don't know how long. We don't know if it's 30 days or six months or, uh, <laughs> or what. Um, we don't know who bought it. Um, it's uh, part of an LLC uh, so that the buyers are not disclosed. And um, uh, so all we do know is that um, uh, we're going to be here as long as we're here. And then um, <laughs> I did have this flash. I remember the movie Apostle. I was thinking of putting the Bible down in front of the bulldozer and saying, "Okay, come on, man!" <laughs> in front of the TV cameras, you know. I, I did have that for one brief sinful moment. And uh, but uh, so anyway, uh, I wanted you to know that. Um, and uh, and we have a lot to uh, be grateful for, a lot to be thankful for. And, and as soon as I heard this. I knew the passage that we were going to be looking at today for our message. It's, uh, and the reason is, on our first Sunday together as a church, way back when, uh, this was the passage that we uh, looked at to think about who uh, we might become as a church. Mm -hmm. From Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, sorry, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their possessions and goods they gave to anyone else they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I think that's still true as we look at it. So pray with me. Lord, we just uh, we trust you, we love you, and we know that you never leave us or forsake us. And so we pray that you teach us once again from your word, what it means for us to be the church together. And um, we thank you for the use of this place, just as we thank you for the use of the pizza parlor and the use of the house. And we thank you in advance for wherever we go from here. Um, but we ask that you would stay very close. And, uh, you know, actually, this whole thing of, uh, of Losing this church building so suddenly like that, I, I need to tell you, it's probably my fault. Um, and it, it, ever since I signed that contract for the new book, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. <laughs> you know, cancer surgery, health problems, Eileen's back surgeries, Damien's uh, rehab stuff, and all these things. But And we tore up our kitchen and the second week of January, and it's still torn up, and I'm still cooking on a hot plate in the garage. Um, all that's gone up, but through it all, I have maintained, at least Harbor Church is going good. <laughs> Harbor Church is trouble-free. Harbor Church is going along smooth. It's, you know, I got that. And then I went, doggone it. The next book is going to be How to Have an Easy, Simple, Prosperous Life with No Problems. That's my next book. And, and then we're ready for that, right? Will that work? It is weird, you know, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. And I thought, 
well, here we go. You know, we're ready for a new adventure, aren't we? And uh, I need to confess that I'm not somebody who feels really comfortable uh, not knowing what the next steps are. I'm not really comfortable not being in control, though I'm usually not in control, but I like to pretend that I am. And, uh, and so not having that has been a, a bit of a difficulty. Um, but I have this deep belief that um, God did not bring us this far just to leave us. Uh, he's brought us a long ways, and, uh, and we've gone through a lot together, and I don't believe he's finished with us. And, and because of that, I have great hope uh, for the next step that I know uh, what it is. You know? um, and just so you know a little bit of history, um, it was uh, the second week of February, about seven years ago, when uh, Peter, the uh, owner of Romeo's Pizza, who had been involved kind of with the Bulgarian mob, uh, came to me and said, we're closing the restaurant in two weeks. I'm breaking with the mob. We're legal now, and uh, we're shutting down the restaurant, so you won't be able to be here anymore. The next afternoon, I got a phone call saying, there's an empty church in Crown Hill. Would you like it? And I went, where's Crown Hill? <laughs> Never heard of that, <laughs> you know. And, and, and so uh, I feel like we didn't know about this. It came unexpectedly. And uh, they closed the restaurant we were meeting in at the end of February. And March 1st, we moved in here in two weeks. So God can do whatever God wants to do. And, uh, and, and I need to be good with that. And you need to be good with that. Um, what does this passage tell us about the church? Well, first of all, there is no mention in there of the uh, church building that they were gathering in. That's the first thing. That's not even mentioned. The church is who we are apart from the building. And I know many times you've asked me, you know, hey, you going into the church this afternoon? And I'd say yes, but there were no followers of Jesus gathered to pray and to study script. There was nobody here. And I'd go, yeah, I'm going to the church. Well, actually, I didn't. I just went to this old dance hall and hung out for a while. And so the church is really nothing to do with the building, although it's so easy for us to associate it because it's so tangible in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and so uh, what is it that the, that the church did? Well, they, they were devoted, uh, united in, uh, in studying scripture, applying it to their lives, uh, uh, biblical teaching, and, um, and looking to see what God is saying in his word. And, and I think that's still true today, isn't it? That we need to be reminded, even if we know a lot about the Bible, we need to be reminded, oh yeah, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Oh yes, in this world you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Um, I think we need to be reminded of that all the time. Uh, whatever it is that we're going through or not going through or about to go through. Um, and so we do gather. And, and we do uh, say, Lord, teach us today, speak into our lives, and we, and we share how a passage applies in our own lives with each other, and, and that becomes an encouragement, isn't it? That, that's what it is. It, it gives us courage. Um, the other thing that, that happened was this fellowship. And uh, for a lot of years, I had a misunderstanding about fellowship, uh, because um, the fellowship is different than being in a social club. It's different than being in the country club. It's different than being in a, a high school reunion planning team. Um, it's different than hanging out and having donuts. That's not the fellowship that this is talking about. The fellowship here is something that happens when the Holy Spirit uh, in, in infuses our life and it infuses our relationships and uh, we become encouragers to each other. 
That's when the fellowship happens. When we when we care and we pay attention and we listen and we speak uh, lovingly into each other's lives. That's the fellowship. And uh, it actually has very little to do with whether you eat the donuts or not. <laughs> uh, but it does have a lot to do with um, the fact that we belong with each other to the Lord. And our identity with each other is in the Lord. And our future with each other is in the Lord. Um, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the, the comforter who is going to come. Comforter. And that, that word in, in the Greek means to come alongside and, and make someone stronger. That's what comfort is. It's not just saying, oh, I hope you get over that. You know, It's uh, how do we help you become stronger? So the Holy Spirit in our life makes us stronger. And, and as the Holy Spirit works in our life and we share with each other and we care for each other, we we do it in a way that makes them stronger. And so uh, our life together is far stronger than, than our life alone or individually or anything we might have come up with, uh, with clever discussion questions or icebreakers or whatever we might have done. Um, it's different level because it is the empowering the Holy Spirit through you, in you, through you, with you, and, and it makes us different people. And I have seen that happen with you here uh, in Harbor Church so many times. I don't think there's a person who's come to Harbor Church who didn't come here out of some need or question or issue. Nobody just comes here because they're feeling like it's a sunny day and they wandered in. That has never happened yet that I know of. Um, but God does profound things in each one of us uh, as he brings us one by one into this place. And we've seen that in this fellowship. Um, the incredible tangible care when people most needed encouragement. And from unlikely people in unlikely places, that encouragement comes. And we're, we're different because of it. Uh, profoundly different. Um, and then they were marked by the sharing of, and the breaking of bread. Now, um, as a pastor, I always say, well, that means that we do communion together. Every first Sunday of the month, we share communion, which probably is, that may be what it is. But it's also, you know what else it is? Eating. It's also eating. You know? I'm so excited. Sometimes when it's small groups meet during the week, what do they do? They have dinner. <laughs> you know? God, come over. You may not like the uh, sharing or the Bible study or anything, but you're going to love the salmon. You know, I get that. <laughs> I do. And uh, and one of the things that, that I really uh, enjoyed uh, about our times together is these weird lunches that we sometimes have after church. Uh, for no reason. It's not even a holiday, not a national holiday. It's just, uh, oh, you know, if you want, why don't you hang around and we're going to eat? Are we celebrating something? No, we're just going to eat. Was there a program? Do we have to listen to a talk again? <laughs> no, we're just going to eat. And I think that that has helped shape who we are. The fact that we just sit down with people we may not know well and reading together and laughing and hearing stories and asking where we've been and where we're going and all those things. And it's, it's, it's turned us into a church. Isn't that weird? And sometimes the food wasn't that good. Sometimes it wasn't enough of it. Um, sometimes it was great. There wasn't enough of it. But um, but I think there's something about saying, you know, let's just sit down and eat and talk and share. And that's a sacred time. It's a very sacred time. So they did that. And then the last thing they did, it says, is that they were devoted to prayer. Prayer, coming back. It's 
connecting with the Lord, uh, having an honest conversation with God, which is remarkable, bringing our cares, our concerns, our fears and hopes, and then taking the time to listen and let God speak into our life. And sometimes we do it alone, sometimes we do it together, sometimes we do it with one or two people. Um, but it keeps the communication so that God can speak into our life in really profound ways. And sometimes when God speaks to us, I, I found in our time here, it, it's been uh, ethereal things, you know, God shared with me, you know, kind of uh, what I'm supposed to do in my life. Uh, and, and that's great. And sometimes people have come to me with the most specific things and said, well, I was at worship today and God spoke to me and uh, so um, I need, this is what I'm going to do. And I go, I was there and I didn't hear it. How could God have spoken to you? You know? And uh, I mean, so is it okay to mention a few of these? Sure, why not? Okay. Uh, I remember the Sunday morning after church with Fred walked up to me. And, oh, sorry. We were trying to open the preschool for the first time, and it was a dump downstairs. Cement floors, crappy, 50 year old tile for kids to crawl on. Fred said, Well, it's really weird. I was just sitting here in church, and right in the middle of the service, I felt bad say, uh, You need to buy carpet for the downstairs of the church. And I, went, I didn't hear that. <laughs> and, and he said, no, that's what God said, so that's what I'm going to do. And then uh, I said, well, okay, we'll look at it. And then I'm like, oh, my goodness, the, the fellowship hall's too big. That thing's giant, you know, and they charge by the yard. And uh, that's going to be a minute. So I went to Fred and I said, I think it was a mistake. God told you you need to carpet the preschool area, right, for the kids. And he went, no, he just said carpet the downstairs, <laughs> you know. And uh, how many dinners and times and kids have played in there? Wedding receptions. Wedding receptions. Yeah, you're already really reception. And, uh, and then the AA group came, which is one of the largest AA groups in Seattle. And it came in at 15 people to sit down in that new carpeted room. And um, it's now around 100. And uh, they're all under 30 years of age. If you're 35, Damien said, you don't belong there. Uh, it's alive. And it's their home. Because you said, well, God just told me, I don't, I don't care what you say, John. <laughs> That's not just about listening to God. Uh, we had uh, an opportunity. We heard about Jan and Jeremy that could come up and do a one-year internship here, and they needed a particular stipend that was required, and we had no money. Uh, we had no ability to do that. And uh, Pam Prosky, uh, said after church, well, you know, God put it on her heart, and so she wants to pay for their stipend for the year. Um, I said, you want to donate towards it, probably, you know, as we'll probably have to raise some money. No, no, God said pay for that stipend for that year. Um, what? And you all know that we had borrowed $10,000 that we had to pay back, and I hadn't had the courage to talk about it, and it was due in June a few years ago. And um, one, of the, one of our people got up, came up to me afterwards and said, I heard there's a debt due in June. Um, I'm not sure about the details, but um, God told me to uh, give you this check for $10,000. Two weeks before it was due. Um, and three months later, I did his funeral. Mm -hmm. But it was just my, I'm just doing what God told me to do. This has happened over and over and over again. And not just big ticket items, it happens in little ways. It happens in, uh, you know, uh, God's telling me I need to go talk to this person who came in. It looked like they're struggling with something. And you get up and you go over and you talk to them afterwards. Or you go to coffee with them during the week. And uh, how does God deal? It's when, it's because we're people of prayer. We're people of prayer, and that's who we are. You know, um, towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, the disciples kept asking him all the time, uh, what's, when's the kingdom come? 
How will we know? What's going to happen? Uh, how's it going to be when you're in power? And which one of us gets to sit on your right hand? Which gets to sit on the left hand? And our mom's talking about that with you. And uh, they had all these questions, questions, questions. And Jesus kept going, you're not going to know the day or the time. Uh, the end of um, Luke, and uh, Luke wrote Acts, so it's connected that way. But, um, Luke 18. Jesus is probably fed up with all their questions. You know. Well, I'm not a person like that, but I probably would even. Uh, in the midst of all these questions, what's going to happen? Uh, Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples this parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. What do you do when you want to give up? What do you do when your hope goes sideways? What do you do when you feel powerless to make a difference in a situation? What do you do to, I'm telling you this parable, not so you get a nice little parable, but so that you'll always pray and never give up. That's the antidote for our in-between times. Now, you know me well enough to know that I don't embrace in-between times. I mean, I live in them, but I don't embrace them. I, I always think, okay, if we just get through this next thing, then it's going to be okay. Everything will be great after that. Then you get through the, that thing, and then you know what you find? No. Yeah, there's something else that you weren't bothering to notice because you were busy working on this one. And then you get through it, and you go, oh, man, now i got to get through this thing. But as soon as I'm through it, that, yeah, then everything's going to be good then. Guess what? Yeah, then you're over here. You know, I, I don't know how long the cord is, but you know, I mean, keep, keep going till I'm out that window. But um, the in-between times are really hard for us. Why? Why are they so hard? The unknown. It's the unknown, and frankly, I get the feeling of, what if I'm not adequate for that? What if I can't handle that? And it's almost like God's shouting, you can't, you're not adequate for it. If you were adequate for it, you wouldn't need me. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> but it's the truth, isn't it? We weren't meant to be adequate for it. We weren't meant to be able to handle it. We weren't meant to be able to fix things before they were broken. If we could do that, we wouldn't need the Lord. There'd be, yeah, you know, Lord, why don't you go deal with those people who can't handle it? You know, those people. Because I'm okay here. He's going, no, you're really a mess, Westfall. And so, you know, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay with you because you really need me. You don't even know it yet. And you really need me. That's what I've learned with you all. And I found that Life surprises us in, in ways that we don't want to be surprised. I remember um, I was interested in a couple that came to church. They, they came in and then uh, kind of disappeared for a while. I asked them how they found us. And they said, well, they held up Damien's flyer with a guy with a bag on his head saying, you don't have to be perfect to come to Harbor Church. Remember that? Our first <laughs> advertisement in the community. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And uh, I said, well, no, we sent that out a year, almost a year ago. Yeah, well, we kind of kept it, you know, until we felt like going to church. And I go, well, what prompted today? I woke up and thought, well, why don't we try going to church? So I called Larry up and said, man, why don't we go to Starbucks? Okay, so we went to Starbucks, we talked, he told me, you don't have this friend, David, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, creative, eccentric guy, you know, but he, maybe you could have him come to Starbucks and we could get to know each other, that'd be okay, I'm not sure, you know. That was, on, I think it was a Tuesday morning, and uh, Sunday, I get a text, my daughter died. And uh, in the night. And so Larry and Dave walked in. That's where I met you. We sat right back there. 
And we just basically, I sat and cried. They sat and cried. I sat and cried, you know. And that became the beginning of years of friendship and ministry and care. Lives are never the same. And uh, Randy, when your mom died, you know, you guys have probably been to church twice. <laughs> I don't know about that time. I don't know. A little bit. He says it a few times. And uh, through her service and the grave son and all these things, and our lives got melded somehow together. And uh, God's used this place that way. Great celebration. I mean, your wedding reception, it was fun. And uh, so, what happens? Do you think God brought us this far just to leave us? No. Um, think He might have a new chapter for us? Okay. Yeah. Anybody know what it is? <laughs> I'm just checking. You know, I am. Well, the reality is these four four walls don't define us. The Holy Spirit being inside each one of us. Yeah. Jesus walking alongside each one of us. And God watching over each one of us. Yeah. Isn't that something? And, uh, and I mean, you know what I think? You know, Chuck... <laughs> We, we were sitting in the dark in here, these little dim lights, and it was really, really dark. And we tried, we tried videotaping a few of those early sermons, and, and uh, our faces were all dark in the shadows and all those things. And, and Chuck said, well, I know something about electricity. Let's put spotlights in, you know? And uh, amazing gift. And uh, somebody else said, let's bulldoze, you rented the bulldozer, Dave. Let's rent the let's rent a bulldozer and take out the cement piles that have been buried under the surface of the ground. Let's put a garden in there. And then the pouring rain, you and you and Mark were out there bulldozing cement foundations out of the ground for a community garden with less than acres. You know, I don't know. The stories could go on. Uh, when. Uh, when I was at University Press and um, and Bruce Larson just resigned and I was devastated and I said, I had made a commitment that I'd be here as long as you're here and now you're gone. What the heck? You know? <laughs> it wasn't really a betrayal so much as the life change. And he goes, you get to find out what it's like to have to let go of the trapeze. Mm -hmm. and I went, I'm not a circus guy. You're going to have to explain. <laughs> and... Uh, he ended up taking Elaine and I then into the circus to show us. But um, this was before uh, uh, computer-generated graphics that make it look scary, but it isn't really. This was actually really scary. And they get way up there, you know, and they, they start slowly throwing the trapeze. Endlessly. You know, just slowly, so kind of getting the rhythm going. And somebody on the other side is slowly throwing the trapeze, throwing... And I thought, well, that's really an interesting thing, you know. I think I'll go get a soda. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's this time where you have to kind of jump off the platform on your holding the trapeze and you go out there. And I thought, you know, I could do that. I could swing out there and then when I come back, have them grab me. Or I could swing out, they could grab me. That'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Not like John's evil plan to take <laughs> take three other people down with him, you know, out of the airplane. But <laughs> parachuting this afternoon, uh, and I just want to tell you, falling feels like flying for a little while. <laughs> I just want to say, but um, yeah. So at some point you go out there, and then what they do is they go out, 
and they have to let go of the trapeze to catch the next one that's coming their way, right? And guess what happens when you let go of the trapeze? You're hanging there, holding on to that air. Like you guys paid an extra hundred bucks to get, to get a little longer hanging there in the air. Uh, um, and now that this makes no sense, I mean, it's one thing if you do like Tarzan, you know, he'd swing out with a rope and then he'd grab the next one and then he'd swing out and then he'd grab the next one. I'm a specialist in Tarzan trivia. And uh, he never let go, you know. But, um, but with the trapeze, you have to let go and some of them get crazy and flip around and stuff in the air and then catch the next one that's, that's there. And, and I realized it takes an awful lot of faith to let go of that first trapeze and have to go out through the air. And you have to have faith that the other person had the timing right and that it would be there. And if it's not there or if it's not at the right distance and you miss it, you know, there's all kinds of things that could happen, that none of which are good. And, uh, and you grab the next one. Now I imagine the first time they did that successfully, they thought, okay, well, this is a lifetime experience. I'm really glad I've done that. Check that off the bucket list, you know? And they go, no, we're having an, uh, an evening show tonight, too. You got to get up and do it again. What, what you talking about, Willis? You know, I mean, we're, not, we're doing that. And, uh, and then pretty soon you're doing it all the time. You just swing out and let go and believe that the next one's going to be there. And I feel like that's what we get to do. On that February 14th, when Peter told me that they're shutting down the restaurant and we have nowhere to meet, I thought, huh. But then I got comfortable here. You know, schools prospering, AA's prospering, the garden's prospering, we had a Shakespeare company, we had like 50 people yesterday for the two shows, and, and just going, wow, this is really working, you know, everything's great. Boom. Let go of the trapeze and believe that God will be there. Grab your wrists, take you on to the next one. Can we do that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Are we willing to do that? Yeah. Okay. Can we do it together? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you'll do it, okay, I will too then. I wasn't, I wasn't going to commit until I heard if you guys were interested. <laughs> You're not going to, whoa. Let me see if I wrote anything down here that I forgot. Oh, yeah, okay. One more thing. There, we have absolutely no um, answers for all the most common questions that are going to come. How long, where, when, how, who, any of those that we have absolutely zero answers. And I called the, the, our landlord for clarification. I had all these questions. How long, when, who's buying it, what the deal is, can we stay, all these things. He went, once we signed the papers last Saturday, um, out of our hands, and we have no idea. You'll find out. Could be 30 days, could be six months, who knows. And, um, and I thought, we don't know even one answer to the most common questions that are going to be asked and that we want to have answers for. Not one, not even one of these common questions do we have an answer for. And then I realized we have the answer for the only question that matters. There's only one question that matters. And that is, is Jesus going to leave us and forsake us because he's a liar? He was kidding. He only meant I'll, I'll never leave you or forsake you as long as you're in the building and everything's working out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only... Uh, Answer that matters is who do you trust? Mm -hmm. Who are you going to trust? Mm -hmm. That's the only only question we need to answer. And if we say, Lord, 
I'm going to trust you. I believe. Help my unbelief. He says, I love you. I, I care about you. I, every single one of you, I care about you. And I'm not going to leave. So, that's God's work for today. Let's pray. Lord, we belong to you. No one else. And we don't know what the future holds, and we don't know anything, but we know that the future is in you. And that's enough. That's all we need to know. So, thank you for the great privilege of traveling with these saints. And we pray that you would uh, draw us close to you. And in those in-between times, help us to pray a little more. And, uh, and hold on to us tight. We need you very much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.